Well, welcome everybody to uh, our second BACI, which is the Broadacre Cropping Initiative uh, Research Showcase. Um, it's really nice to see all the people here and uh, we are uh, lucky that we didn't have any rain overnight so that we've got everybody can turn up today. I'd like to welcome everybody here today uh, to this showcase. Before we begin, I'd like to hand over to Janine Meyer, who will be, do the, perform the official Welcome to Country. Janine. There we go. All right. Gumba Daru, good day. My name is Janine Meyer, and I'm a proud Western Waka Waka woman and a traditional custodian of this land. My great-great-grandmother Jane was Western Waka Waka and of Darlow descent, sister to my uncle, Harry Darlow, who is known as Uncle Bunda. My personal line then continues down through Granny Jane's daughter, my great-granny who was born Phyllis Tabane, and her oldest daughter, my nana, who was born Sandra Tabane. I am the only child of Nana Sandra's second eldest daughter, Sharon. My ancestors have walked and nurtured the beautiful land we're gathering on for thousands of years, and on behalf of my ancestors and my people, I would like to welcome you all wholeheartedly to our home. I was born in a small town, Kingaroy, known as the peanut capital of Australia, and grew up about 25 kilometres from there in a small rural town called Nanango. Though small, this place is the fourth oldest town in Queensland with a lot of history, one of which being that this place was used as a gateway to the bunny nut gatherings. When I was ready to start my senior schooling, I made my way to Toowoomba, staying with my uncle Conrad on my family's land and started embracing and learning more about the true history of one of the most important Aboriginal historical sites where I was calling home at the time. This place is called Gumanguru. The name Gumanguru was given in the late 90s by the elders and means men of the river. There are a series of ceremonial placements of stones where young men were initiated into manhood to, to continuing on their way to participate in what's known as men's business. This site was also known as a place where different tribal groups travelling from all over southeast Queensland and New South Wales would stop and meet on their way to the Bunya Nut Festival at the Bunya Mountains, which in its traditional language is known as the Bonnie Bonnie, and this occurred roughly every three years. Our indigenous cultures are amongst the oldest living cultures in human history. We take pride in our sustainability and we deeply value our spiritual connections and belonging within our land and our people of the past and present and our oldest elder country itself. Our heritage maintained a balanced relationship with the land, only taking what we needed to provide safety, shelter, food and water without any waste. We used what the land provided for us and we provided back. We have an obligation to care for the earth the way it is cared for us. Continuing this cycle is so crucially important because it is part of our identity and for anything to thrive it needs nourishment and nurturing. We are a caring community of people with different traits to individualise us, but together we are one, we stand as one, and we love as one. Graciously, my ancestors left footprints in the soil marking our history. I'd like to pay my respects and show my acknowledgements to not only all of your ancestors and elders, not only all of my ancestors and elders, but also all of yours. Our people from the past, our people that are currently making their footprints now in the present, and for those in the future who are emerging and starting to take their first steps. Thank you all. I hope you all have an amazing day today. Thanks very much, Janine. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the lands and waterways on which we meet today. Further, I acknowledge the First Nations of Southern Queensland and their ongoing connection to country, lands and waterways. Further, I recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first educators and researchers of Australia. I pay deep respect to Elders past and present. I would also like to at this stage acknowledge uh, the presence of the UNISQ colleagues, including Professor Geraldine McKenzie, who is the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Southern Queensland. Uh, Mr Chris Baisley, uh, UNESQ Council Member, Agricultural Business Advisor and Farmer. Professor Honourable John McVeigh, Executive Director for the Institute for Resilient Regions and the Senior Executives of the University. I'd like to also uh, acknowledge the representatives of the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries Queensland, uh, Ms Bernadette Ditchfield, who's the Deputy Director General, Dr Wayne 
Hall, Executive Director of AgriScience Queensland, and I know you're up the back there, Wayne, trying to hide away. Uh, Miss Megan McKenzie, down here at the front here, Acting General Manager of Crop and Food Science, AgriScience Queensland. And Do Dr Angela Mordoko, who's the Acting Director of Policy and Partnerships for AgriScience Queensland. We're here today to showcase the amazing uh, collaboration that we have with the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries in Queensland. We're very proud of what we're doing and what we have achieved through this. What we're looking at at the moment is the implementation and collaboration and translation of that research going forward. So to begin with, I'd like to hand over to the Vice-Chancellor, uh, Geraldine McKenzie, to give us a short presentation. Thank you, Geraldine. Thanks, Gavin, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here on behalf of the university, uh, both Gavin and Janine, and thank you so much, Janine, for that lovely, lovely welcome to country. Both Gavin and Janine have acknowledged country, and I'd like to do the same, and also acknowledge that where we are today has always been a place of learning and teaching for the traditional custodians. It's wonderful to have everybody here today. I won't go through the acknowledgements again, but it's particularly good to have Bernadette Ditchfield here, Deputy Director General, and I understand that Dr Chris Sara also sends his apologies. It's a sitting week at the moment in Brisbane, but fantastic to have so many representatives from the department here today. We are indeed very proud of what we have achieved with the Broadacre Cropping Initiative, and this showcase again highlights the wonderful work that has been done and we're very, very proud of that. The university has achieved great things in research. Our rankings results are certainly on the up. We've been ranked number 410 in the world in the QS World Rankings and uh, three in the 351 to 400 ranking in Times Higher Education. And these are really demonstrating how the university is pushing up to be at the moment in the top 2% of universities worldwide. Much of that is due to our work here in research and with agriculture in one of our flagship areas, we're very, very proud of what we've achieved. Our partnership with the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries is a deep one and a broad one. We're very proud of what we've achieved. It started in 2014 and is still going strong. Partnerships such as this with industry, with government, the universities, are what is driving this essential research and providing solutions to some of the really intractable problems of our time. Through initiatives such as this, we continue to drive essential research to recognise what those problems are and to provide solutions. This strong collaboration is certainly reaping benefits for Queensland broadacre agriculture, certainly Queensland, Australia and internationally. It really provides an opportunity to showcase the work that we're doing here. We've put a heavy investment in the university in this area through the Agricultural Science and Engineering Precinct over on the other side of the campus off Baker Street. And I have to say that the wonderful results that we're getting shows that that investment certainly has been the right thing to do and has richly repaid not only the research that we're doing here, but much broader. So thank you again for coming. We hope that it's a really productive day and I'll hand you back to Gavin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Geraldine. I'd like now to hand over to Bernadette Ditchfield, uh, who's the Deputy Director General, Department of Agriculture and Fisheries Queensland, for a few words. And I've, I've just strung that out so you've got enough time to get oh, here. Good, um, good morning, everyone. Um, as Gavin said, I'm Bernadette Ditchfield, the Deputy Director General for Agriculture. I just want to thank Janine, and I think she's not, not here anymore, but, um, uh, you know, um, I just want to thank her for sharing her family story. Stories are so important for us to learn from each other. I also wanted to acknowledge the traditional land on, that we're meeting today and any um, Indigenous people in the room today. I also wanted to acknowledge Geraldine and John um, and Gavin for their leadership and also acknowledge my team here, um, Wayne and Megan, Mark and Angela. 
Um, I'd also, I, I can't be standing here really without acknowledging, I suppose, the ter turmoil that's happening around in your local communities with the bushfires. So I did want to acknowledge any um, rural fire brigade people here today or even, um, you know, our emergency response people. It has been a challenging last couple of days and thankfully um, I think the cooler weather might be coming and a little bit of rain so it might ease conditions. Agriculture is vital to Queensland's economy with a total value of um, primary production forecast to be about 22.67 million in 23-24. Of course, agriculture is particularly important in our regions with the Darling Downs, Maranoa and Toowoomba providing almost 30% of Queensland's GVP and almost half of this from the broadacre cropping alone. Despite the challenges of COVID-19, the agriculture sector has remained strong. The Department of Agriculture and Fisheries vision is to see Queensland's be prosperous and resilient and lead, lead global food security and sustainability. We are here to grow Queensland. And we do this by building great relationships like UniSQ, building resilient communities, developing opportunities for industry and walking with First Nations Queenslanders. Backy, the Broadacre Cropping Initiative partnership began in 2014 as an alliance to connect research, 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 researchers and resources to create impact for the Broadacre Cropping sector. It has built critical research capacity and capability to enhance delivery to Queensland's cropping industries. Over this time, the partnership has yielded significant gains including contributing to building the capacity of the industry through increased attraction of both undergraduate and postgraduate students, attracting significant in infrastructure investment, leading to the construction of world-class agricultural science and engineering precinct on the Toowoomba campus, and the more recent acquisition of a growth room facility and plant phenotyping system. The formation of numerous partnerships and collaborations, including with other universities like U University of Technology and UQ, and partnerships with local and national businesses like FKG and t um, the Toowoomba and Surat Basin um, Enterprise, as well as all levels of government as well as global partners. UniSQ is a regional university with a strong connection to its local and regional rural communities. The university is committed to establishing its, establishing its position among the world's leading research bodies in the areas of agriculture and the environment. It is also committed to aligning its priorities with government, industry and community. Agri Moving forward, agribusinesses will be increasingly reliant on, upon the effective management of issues such as climate variability, resource scarcity, high input costs and biosecurity threats. Research, development and extension will play a cr critical role in reducing these impacts. Is, there, is therefore crucial that Baki remains um, can, and continue to be at the forefront of solving agricultural challenges, particularly in the areas of agricultural technology, agricultural systems modelling, crop health and soil water innovation. Projects supported by Baki, some of you will hear more about this morning, have been and will continue to be very important for solving these challenges ahead for our sector. Today's theme of impact through industry collaboration continues to showcase the importance of relationships. It is a chance to not only celebrate the great research that has, and partnerships um, that has been achieved to date, but also a time to reflect and foster new relationships. Baki's collaborators, many of you, many, all of you really, have grown steadily since, since its inception and now includes key industry organisation, businesses, universities, governments, and international organisations. Events like today strengthen these relationships, foster innovation, and leads to the advancement of technology and knowledge. Thanks, Gavin. And thank you very much for, you know, to the organisers for today. I think it's going to be a great day. Thanks very much, Bernadette. Very nice. So uh, I'd like to now introduce uh, the Professor, the Honourable John McVeigh. Uh, John is the Executive Director for the UniSQ Institute for Resilient Regions and also the Hub Director 
to the Southern Queensland, Northern New South Wales Innovation Hub. Up to you, John. Thank you very much, Gavin, and good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, great uh, thrill to be asked uh, by Gavin and colleagues to um, uh, simply officially launch uh, this research showcase uh, for Backy here today, uh, and I'll explain why I am so pleased to be here uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, obviously, I want to commence by acknowledging the traditional owners uh, and, uh, and uh, the senior executives, both from uh, UniSQ and DAF. Thank you very much, uh, Bernadette, uh, for your comments just now. Um, and I reflect, ladies and gentlemen, on some of the words uh, that Bernadette uh, shared with us. And amongst the most important words were relationships, collaboration, uh, and I think that's obviously very much the theme of uh, this research showcase. Uh, now, as Gavin said, uh, I uh, head up the Institute for Resilient Regions here at UniSQ, uh, very much a sister institute of Gavin's institute. Um, and uh, uh, again, that word resilience has been used by uh, both Bernadette and I note uh, the Vice-Chancellor a little earlier as well. So some common themes here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, our institute, um, the Institute for Resilient Regions, is very much about all of the social sciences. So the social, economic, health, uh, well-being, behavioural, cultural challenges and opportunities facing regions across Queensland, in fact, across Australia. And certainly amongst that, there's a very strong uh, First Nations theme, um, particularly in areas uh, where we're continuing to work on drought preparedness, drought resilience. So we do our work in our institute across uh, communities right across the state, as I said in particular, uh, although we do work across the country as well. And uh, those relationships are very similar to what we see with this Backy initiative between UniSQ and DAF. Um, for example, we partner with the department uh, with the Rural Economies Centre of Excellence, headed up by my colleague, Associate Professor Ben Lyons. And that's a collaboration led by UniSQ here, uh, but uh, one that involves JCU, uh, Central Queensland University, and of course, the University of Queensland. And again, I stress that collaboration is equally supported by DAF. For example, we're working in policy, we're working in supply chain development, we're working now in decarbonisation and what that might mean for regional communities from a workforce perspective in particular across Queensland in the decades to come. Uh, and we're certainly doing a lot of work in regional drought resilience planning uh, with the department um, and with the support of the federal government under the Future Drought Fund. That takes us, ladies and gentlemen, from Torres Strait, southwest Queensland, central west, and currently, for example, working in southeast Queensland. So sitting with the Lord Mayor of Brisbane, um, uh, Adrian Schriner and his team, and other mayors from out south, throughout southeast Queensland, working on drought preparedness. And that is more relevant now than uh, certainly it has been in the last uh, 18 months, two years that our drought hubs have been established across the country as we enter back into drought. And that preparedness, that tr resilience, I know will be some of the uh, themes that we'll hear in the showcase today. Uh, in mentioning the Future Drought Fund and the drought hub that we lead here for Southern Queensland, Northern New South Wales, where we have a relationship, collaboration again, uh, Bernadette, with both the Queensland Department of Agriculture and Fisheries uh, but, uh, and, and, and the uh, New South Wales Department of Primary Industries um, across, um, uh, across uh, that region of southern Queensland, northern New South Wales. We're one of eight hubs across the country. And uh, just a little earlier this morning, the Federal Minister, Senator Murray Watt, announced further funding at the National Farmers Federation Conference in Canberra for uh, extension to drought hub activities um, across the country uh, as they look at the new funding plan for 24 through to 2028. So a significant amount of work to come through for uh, us and our partners in the coming years. So I think uh, there's a couple of examples there of how much the University of Southern Queensland values these collaborations, these 
partnerships, in this case at Backy, high quality research outcomes in broadacre cropping. Um, I'm thrilled, as I was reflecting with Megan just a little earlier, I'm particularly thrilled because this is an initiative uh, that got underway uh, with some ground work that we did when I was working with the department um, about 10 years ago. So a real thrill to be here, uh, to see it come to fruition over the last, uh, uh, since that time. Gavin, congratulations to you and the whole UniSQ team. Um, again, uh, I join with the Vice-Chancellor um, and uh, uh, Council member, Chris up the back there, um, in welcoming everyone here to UniSQ. Um, I trust you have a great day, enjoy the proceedings. And a quick shout out to, uh, to Liz and Kirsten and others who have done all of the organisation uh, behind today, the sorts of people that make people like Gavin and I look good, <laughs> which is hard work, Gavin. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much, John. And, and it's harder work for some than others. <laughs> it's great uh, to have you here today. Um, and I think some of the things that you've said has shown the clear linkages that we have between this Backy Agreement, the research that's being done, and the work that John's group is doing in resilient regions and through the, the uh, drought hub. I'm now thrilled and delighted to introduce uh, Ms. Megan McKenzie, who's the, uh, Cro so who's the Acting General Manager for Crop and Food Science, Department of Agriculture and Fisheries, Queensland. Thank you, everyone, and it's good to be here. Um, as Gavin said, I'm the Acting General Manager of Crop and Food Science in the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries, and in my substantive role, I'm actually the Director of R&D Policy and Partnerships. Um, so this is, I might be a little biased in my talk today. Um, I'd like to start also by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land in which we gather um, and thank um, Geraldine Myers for the lovely welcome to country. Um, I also want to acknowledge traditional um, people, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who join with us here today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the distinguished uh, executives of the University of Southern Queensland and the department here, um, and, and all of our esteemed college, uh, colleagues, researchers, industry representatives. Um, as I said, I, I'm honoured to be here. I'm usually in the audience, and I was in the audience for the last showcase, um, because this relationship uh, really does demonstrate impact through collaboration for, for Queensland. Um, I was around nine years ago in 2014 when this uh, was established, where the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries transferred 26 of its staff who were very brave um, and, and took on a new journey within the university um, to help establish the Broadacre Cropping Initiative. Um, at the time, under the leadership of Professor Stephen Rain, and I'd like to give a shout out of the legacy that's been created here to, to Stephen, um, and his vision, um, we have developed a fantastic collaboration which is making great impact. At the time, um, back in 2014, the circumstances were that the university was really rich in climate science and agriculture risk management. That group was strong. Uh, the irrigation and water use efficiency area, the mechatronics and the precision ag area. Within the department, we were going through some change and we identified areas that could be transferred to the university that together would develop some synergies um, to, develop in, uh, to uh, create impact. So in 2014, we transferred our wheat um, pathology, our winter crop nematology, our summer grains pathology, our agricultural engineering and our agriculture system modelling group to the university. And though that actually then stemmed for us providing a grant to the university to continue that work. That was the first five years and, and that, was pretty, that was very successful. It ended up we, we developed more researchers, so I think there was in excess of 55 PhD students that were created and additional 18 positions were put on by the university um, and that was extremely successful. We went into another agreement for five years and that was very much around agriculture technology, farming systems um, and other areas. So we've sort of moved along. Um, 
Sparky partnership model, which is based on that transfer of business of all those areas, is it highly successful? It has led to significant outcomes in capacity building, industry communi um, community adoption, and the establishment of vital uh, research infrastructure. And I'd like to acknowledge GRDC has also helped with that and the establishment um, of infrastructure here at UniSQ. Um, the, the impact and collaboration theme is critical and um, has been touched on by all the other speakers. I've got a lot of notes here which are duplication, so I'm going to go ad lib, so just strap yourselves in. Um, I don't get much of an opportunity to speak, so for me, the success of Barkey, and I look after other relationships within Queensland Government, and it has worked probably the best that I can see out of all of the relationships. And there's a few success factors that I want to talk about, particularly around the interaction between the department and UniSQ. For um, any relationship to work, you really do need to have shared set of values. Um, and I, I find that the work between the, the interactions that I have with UniSQ, we do have a shared vision, we do have a shared outcome of where we want to be. Um, and people want to work together. And I think that is really critical in any relationship. I think moving forward, we do have some significant challenges ahead in terms of climate change and adaptation and mitigation. We have to look at how we can use new technologies. And I want to give a shout out. We've got a central Queensland smart cropping centre that we're developing at Emerald. So I see huge opportunities on how we might integrate that with, with the strength of the um, ag tech uh, area within UniSQ, so there might be some richness in that. Um, and also, uh, there's a, um, you know, how do we drive the, the efficient use of inputs? There's great work here in terms of water use efficiency. I know the great work that UniSQ has done for the cotton industry. How do we build on that? How do together do we get go forward and, and, and develop some great projects? It is undeniable that the plant pathology work is continuing in UniSQ and working with our breeding programs with DAF. There's, a hot, there's, there's so many examples of where this, this um, relationship and partnership is working. Unfortunately, today is a showcase. You just get a snapshot. You just get a little bit of all the great work that is happening between our, our group. So, um, I want you to all enjoy it. I, I, I put out a challenge to make yourself uncomfortable and introduce yourself to someone you don't know, uh, to ask some really good questions if, if you want to find out more about the um, science today. Um, so yes, I just wanted to challenge people. Just out of interest, can you put your hand up if you're a researcher in, in the room? Wow, that's awesome. Um, can you put your hand up if you're from government in the room? Okay. And can you put your hand up if you're from industry, whether you're an RDC or you're a grower? Fantastic. So we have a good collection there of, of the cross-sectoral cross of our, um, our system. Can you put your hand up if you love agriculture? <laughs> can you put your hand up if you love science? So we're united in our vision. We're united of why we're here and our values. And that's my point. That's why we're here. Um, enjoy the day. Um, I do want to give a shout out. These, these events don't happen just like that. I know there's been a lot of hard work by Liz and by Kirsten and by the um, operational committee that's a joint committee between DAF and USQ. If you have any questions, just come and talk to us. Happy to talk about the great work that's happening. And yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Megan. And I have to applaud you for the commitment that you've made to the back agreement over that almost 10 years. Um, it has been invaluable to us in terms of growing and maturing that relationship. Uh, that's the official proceedings. We will now move on to the presentations by staff from both uh, the university and uh, some of the staff from DAF, who will be talking about uh, what they've been doing and giving you a snapshot, as Megan said, of the type of research they're doing. Before we get on to that, just a quick reminder that the restrooms are out through the sliding doors and to your right. Uh, and in the event of an emergency, follow the directions of the University of Southern Queensland staff who are scattered around the room. Uh, the uh, exits are clearly marked around the room. 
Hopefully we don't have to use those except the one at the back. Um, as per the agenda, we will be breaking after this session for lunch. Um, we actually have a quite an extended lunch break. Uh, it goes for an hour and a half. Uh, that's because we have really good food, but we also have a poster session. Um, and that poster session will start 20 minutes after lunch actually starts. And there will be short pitches by all of the poster presenters. That will give you an idea of who's presenting and gives you an, uh, who you need to talk to. So you'll also be asked to vote on the best poster and I'll give you a little bit more detail of that before we get into lunch. So let's get started on the first session. So this session will showcase uh, the impact of broadacre cropping industries. There will be science, but there will be impact. The main focus is on the impact of the research. We can delve into the science in the questions and there will be time for questions after each presentation. So I'd like to start and I'd like to start with Dr. Noel Knight. Uh, Noel is a researcher here at the University of Southern Queensland. He's been working with the Mung Bean group, uh, especially Merrill Ryan and Thomas Noble, um, and he'll be talking about pathogen genomics. Great, thanks Gavin, and uh, good morning everyone. I'm going to kickstart the day with mung beans and a project which is looking at pathogen genomics and empowering the mung bean disease resistance breeding. This is predominantly work done at the Centre for Crop Health, but in close collaboration with Tom Noble and Mel Ryan, who are based at the Hermitage Research Station. So for those unfamiliar with mung bean, it's a short duration uh, leguminous summer crop it's popular as a crop rotation between cereals. It's continuing to emerge in Queensland and it also has benefits of fixing nitrogen. So Queensland and northern New South Wales are the major growing regions with around 100,000 tonnes produced each year. Most of this is exported as it's an important part of an Asian diet but because of its protein content it's also being used more and more in plant-based meats and other products. But it can be affected by several diseases. In this case, we'll focus on uh, tan spot, which is caused by a bacterial pathogen, which can be seed borne. Yield losses of up to 25% have been reported, but that's generally more severe in high temperatures and in water stressed environments. In the images I have on the screen, on the left is a clean leaf, and on the right, you can see different extent of the disease symptoms which are occurring, which is this death of the leaf tissue, as well as chlorosis or yellowing. And that's limiting the ability of those mung bean plants to yield. There's also another bacterial pathogen which we're focusing on which causes halo blight. It uh, can also be seed borne and has been reported to cause yield losses of up to between 30 to 50 per cent. But in this case it's more severe at lower temperatures around 24 degrees. It has slightly different symptoms. You can see a distinct halo on the leaves uh, in the images and that's caused by the bacteria with an initial infection point in the middle of that halo. It can start to coalesce to cover a lot of that leaf tissue which again limits the ability of that mung bean to yield. So what this means is that control is essential to limit the impacts of this disease and this begins by monitoring seed production to try to avoid that seed borne pathogen getting planted with the crop in the first place. But also looking at ways of managing the field inoculum so if you can reduce the pathogen in the environment, it means the plant doesn't have to respond or resist to that pathogen, which can help maintain yield. But host resistance is what we rely on a lot of the time, and this is what is incorporated within the mung bean plant itself. So it can be planted in the field, and if it's looked after, it can last and maintain those yields for a long time. And that's what this project is aiming to do, is to support the DAF-led National Mung Bean Improvement Program by generating information on the tan spot and halo blight pathogens. So the approach has goals which range from the practical to the ambitious. Most of these are focused on informing the breeding program, but also better understanding the pathogens and how they're interacting in the environment. All with the concept of having long-term improvements to disease management strategies. So I'll go through some of the practical goals which we have. The first was to generate collections of these bacteria and do DNA sequencing. 
This is important to understand the diversity of these pathogens in the environment and the, has important implications for breeding. If you have diversity in pathogens, they may have different abilities. So knowing what those are can help with the breeding program to choose the right strains for screening against new types of mung bean. It also means we need to have good inoculation methods. So this is something we're looking at as improving inoculation methods so we can get consistent disease expression to best characterise the mung bean varieties. And for field inoculum, we need to understand the host range. So mung beans may not be the only crops which can harbour these pathogens. And by knowing that, we can understand where risks might uh, come in the field and growers can be aware of that. It means we need tools though for specific detection of these pathogens as well as the ability to quantify them. And then we move on to some ambitious goals. One of these is looking at the competition between tan spot isolates. So in this case we do know there's different variations within the bacteria which cause tan spot. But what do these do in the environment? So it's quite likely in a field that you would have different strains interacting. It could be that one dominates another, or it could be that they work together to end up causing more severe disease. So understanding this is important to try and improve our plant breeding as best possible. We also have a question around experimental evolution. Now this might not be a concept everyone's familiar with, but it's basically a way for us to look into the future what it follows is taking our original bacterial pathogen, putting that into a resistant mung bean variety. We always get some disease, but we take that bacteria out again, put it into another healthy plant of the same variety. And we do multiple passages of this experiment. What we look at is what we put in in the beginning and what we get out at the end. So we can see what changes genetically. We might be able to see if it increases in its ability to cause disease, on our different mung bean varieties. And this really starts to answer some questions around the durability of the resistance which we have available in our mung bean varieties, whether there needs to be more focus on generating different types of resistance or whether it will last long into the future. And we have some important results which are already coming out from these projects. The first is an improved tan spot inoculation method where we can now get consistent disease expression. And by using this method, we've been able to identify particularly virulent tan spot isolates. This information has been incorporated into the breeding program so they can try to improve their understanding of how the new varieties are responding. And you can see in the images the impact of that pathogen. So in the control plant, it's just been water inoculated and we have two different isolates which vary in their severity of disease. You can see the leaf symptoms uh, but you can also see that fairly severe stunting which is being caused. So that's another impact of that disease which really highlights what it can do to the health of the plant. But you can see that isolate 2 is causing more severe stunting than isolate 1. So it might be that isolate 2 is being used on a broader scale to screen against mung bean varieties to understand their resistance. We've collected the genomes of multiple isolates of both tan spot and halo blight from across the region. So we can understand now the diversity. We know for tan spot, for example, there are three genetic clusters and halo blight is still being analysed, but it's looking like there is one major type which is present. I think particularly exciting in this data was the identification of a DNA region which is necessary for causing tan spot disease. Pathogens without that region don't cause disease symptoms. So if we're able to now narrow down our idea of what DNA is important, we can start to better understand what resistance might mean and how to improve that. These genomes have also been used to design specific DNA detection tests for each of these pathogens. So we can start to look for them in the environment. We've also identified some alternative hosts and this is uh, partly work done by our PhD student Krishna who's here today and you can catch up with him later for more information. But it's identifying where else this pathogen might be in the environment and starting to identify those risks for disease control. But of course, it's always about forming connections. We've heard about a bit this morning. I've been fortunate to be on the Australian Mung Bean Association Seeds Committee, which has given me a great insight into how the industry works, as well as some of their uh, challenges they see with disease and how we can frame research questions to try to address those. 
been forming links uh, across DAF as well. So Lisa Kelly is a great example. She's got a lot of experience and connections with mungbeans in the field and the issues they go through. So having her as a contact has been really valuable. We're also going further abroad. So the University of Melbourne, we're collaborating, collaborating with a bacterial population geneticist expert to help us with some analyses, as well as within the University of Southern Queensland in the Faculty of Engineering with Dr. Zara Faraji Rudd, who is pioneering work with the use of microneedles. So these are patches of tiny plastic needles which can be stabbed into a plant leaf, particularly a diseased plant leaf, to rapidly extract DNA. That means we can have that DNA for testing much faster than we traditionally could to identify what pathogens could be present. And of course, having the development of new experts, of new knowledge in students is an important part of all of these projects. We've had a range of masters and PhD students, PhD students involved. I have a photo here of our master's students from this year, Bashal, Ayesha and Alina, who've done some great work in mung bean uh, disease issues, as well as Basha, who is a postdoc within this project. So there's a lot of potential future directions, but I see the foundation as these DNA sequences which have been generated. That's going to help us understand a lot more about how these bacteria work and particularly how they're interacting with the disease resistance within the mung beans and what impact that has. But the tools for detection is also particularly important because if we can detect a pathogen, we can start to understand the role of inoculum in the environment and try to track down and limit those pathogens. The resistance which we're getting in mung beans is hard to come by, it takes a long time. So the best thing we can do is try to limit the pathogen in the field to reduce the instances where that plant has to resist the pathogen. And for me, it's always thinking about how these tools can be applied in the field to get growers the best information they can have in their much more complex environments, all with the aim to reduce the impact of diseases on mung bean production. So I'd just like to thank you for your attention this morning and acknowledge a range of researchers who have been involved in this project, particularly Dr Nilava Fagefi, who started this project a few years ago. I've been here for about a year now, having taken over those projects, but she set the foundation for these concepts and development, so I really want to just acknowledge her input. And with that, I will happily take any questions. Hey, Noel. Hi, Paul. Mate, what are you doing here when you should be out working on more on Halo and Tan, please? Because it is a major drama in the mung bean industry. Sorry, Paul McIntosh, everybody. Um, mate, do you have any feel at all, you and Tom and the crew, about whether we're getting most of our problems from the seed, the, the AMA seed, the, the seed that we use to plant in the ground, or is it some other host? you got any idea about that at all at this early stage, please? Uh, personally, I don't have an idea. This is something I'm always thinking about, though. With these tools, we can explore that, because that's a question I'm always having is, if it's in the field, could we, for example, have tested that seed, or has it been tested? Sometimes tests have been done. Uh, I think it's a fundamental thing that we need to understand, and I don't think we've got a good grasp. Tom and I have been working on uh, seed testing for a limited number of seed sources and demonstrating that they can detect it, but it's not, certainly not in every seed source. So it really starts to make us think about where else these bacteria might be surviving in those environments. So I think a great question, I don't have the answers for that, but it is something I'm, I'm wanting to try to explore, particularly with the new tools. Yes, I think that would be the ideal situation with this information we have and our ability to do the detection in seed. We should be able to um, identify what, particularly what types. So if we know the variation in the pathogens, we can have tests, hopefully, that will detect variants to indicate the risk of those. So I see that as definite potential. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Noel. Uh, our next speaker um, is Professor Anka Martin, who's
talking about disease of barley. Good morning, everybody. Um, like Gavin just said, I'm going to talk a little bit about barley and net form net butch disease that affects barley. This work was done in close collaboration with the um, DAF Barley Folia Disease Group, which is led by Liesl Snowman. So those of you not familiar with barley, um, Australia produces on average 10 million tonnes of barley a year with a value of more than $4 billion. So one of the main barley folia diseases in Queensland is net form net blot. It's a fungal disease. It can cause significant um, yield losses and also affect the quality of the grain. It survives on barley stubble and, can, and is also known to be seed borne. And some of the isolates have also been found to be um, fungicide resistance. So one thing that makes this um, disease quite complicated is the number of pathotypes that we can find with this disease. So what that means is that different strains cause disease on different sets of barley genotypes. So that looks like a very complicated table, but just um, look at the, the colors. The ones in the red um, are genotypes that are um, very susceptible to the disease and the, the green means that the genotype is quite resistant to the disease. So on the left hand side you will see a number of different um, names starting with HRS. So those are all different strains of this disease. On the top is are different barley lines of barley genotypes. So when you look at the first um, isolate, so 17003, you can see, for example, that that isolate is susceptible on genotype prior. And it's got different um, reactions on some of the other genotypes. If you look at the isolate three rows down, um, 17011, you can see that that isolate is not susceptible on, all the genotype, on that genotype prior and also varies across the different other different genotypes. So you can see there's a variation between how those strains react on all the different genotypes. So this, this work or this table was produced by DAF. They did all the hard work to produce these results. Now if we look at resistance to net form net blot, um, this is a table just illustrating some of the current barley varieties that growers grow. It's taken from the GRDC 2023 Queensland Winters um, Crop Sowing Guide. So when you look at that, you can see that none of the lines are resistant or resistant to model moderately resistant to the disease. Um, at best, we might have some moderately resistant lines, as indicated there, but most of the lines are moderately resistant to moderately susceptible. So I guess the question is, why do we not have resistant varieties? So one of the, um, one of the problems is the, the vast number of pathotypes, like I've just explained. Um, and the Australian barley varieties are susceptible to at least one of those pathotypes. It's very difficult for breeders to breed for all the pathotypes because they would have to do many, many different seedling assays to test their lines on all the different pathotypes. It is also quite impossible to produce a variety that's resistant to all the pathotypes because, as you can imagine, we're going to need multiple genes going into the germplasm to produce that resistance. On top of that, isolates are constantly evolving and adapted, adapting to the resistant sources that are out there or the barley lines that are grown. On top of that, we really know little about that um, interaction between the host and the fungus. So as part of this um, Backy project, we would like to um, speed up the production of net form, net blood resistant barley varieties by gaining a better understanding of that interaction between the host and the fungus. And so under this project, what we started is first to um, understand the regions in the genome of the fungus that, that cause um, the disease in the host. So doing some genetic studies in that area. We also wanted to use the Becky project um, to leverage some further funding together with DEF and industry um, to continue our research in this area. So to do genetic studies, we basically need a um, population just like we do, like barley breeders or any breeder does produce a population. 
Um, it's fairly easy to do, to do in this fungus. So what we need is two different strains of the fungus. As you can see at the top, we grow them on different plates. We take a plug out of each of those um, strains. We put them next to um, barley straw or wheat straw um, onto another plate. We basically let them grow and, and um, reproduce. And after a few weeks, they produce these little fruiting bodies, as you can see on the straw there. So we just monitor them, and about two to, two to six months after, if we're lucky, um, they're ripening and they're producing ascospores. So once they've formed these little beaks, um, like it has on this straw, we know that they're ripe and they're spitting out ascospores. And we then go and collect the little ascospores. So these spores are genetically unique, and so every spore that we collect is different to another spore. So these spores are basically the progeny of those two parents. And so we, produce, we can produce um, populations of hundreds of these little isolates. And so once we've got the population, the first thing we do is we phenotype the population, and we, still, we do these mostly with seedling assays. We grow the plants for 14 days, we inoculate them, and then we rate them on a scale of 1 to 10. Um, 1 is that they're resistant on that genotype, and 10, they're very susceptible. As you can see on the illustrated here, um, there are lesions all over the leaf, and the leaf starts drying out. So do, to do genetic studies, we also need a genetic map. So this is one of the maps produced by one of our populations. So this fungus has got 12 chromosomes, as indicated um, here. Um, on the right-hand side are DNA markers, and on the left-hand side are the distances. So this really is just a road map to give us an idea where in the genome of the fungus we are. So we then combine the phenotype and the gen genetic map. We do some genetic analysis, and we can then indicate the regions on the genome which are associated with um, causing the disease in the host. So as indicated here, we've identified quite a few regions on those specific chromosomes, and we're um, very much interested in chromosome three and chromosome five, because as you can see, there's quite a few um, regions there that have been identified that are associated with um, causing disease. So basically, Becky has provided us with the funding um, to do our genetic mapping study, so which is the start in um, looking at that um, barley um, fungal interaction. Um, the Becky funding, in collaboration with DAF and industry, um, has also resulted uh, in us being able to submit a federal government um, funded grant application, and we were we were lucky in that in that this um, application was successful and we received an ARC linkage grant at the beginning of the year. So this linkage grant um, money is provided by both the industry partner and the federal um, government. The organisations involved under this new grant are ourselves and DAF, um, industry partners Intergrain and Ackermann Saatzucht in Germany, and we're also collaborating with Curtin University and University of Melbourne. So under the three-year um, ARC linkage, fund, linkage funding, we will further explore the fungal genes associated with virulence that we have um, identified under the Becky project. We will also um, link the fungal virulence genes with the barley host genes and get a better understanding, hopefully, of that interaction. Um, and we will also collaborate closely with deaf and barley breeders to speed up the process of producing resistant net form, net blotch um, varieties. So overall, we will thus work with industry to develop net blot um, resistant barley varieties to increase yield and hopefully at the same time reduce fungicide costs for the Queensland grower. And with that, I would just like to acknowledge Badika and Judy for their contributions to this project. I would also like to thank um, Becky um, for giving us the opportunity to um, do further research in this area and also to have the opportunity to apply for further funding. Um, with that, I just thank you, the audience, for listening, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks very much, Anka.
Uh, you probably noticed that she skated over a lot of information there. There's a lot of work involved in any of that. Any questions from the audience? Yes, we've got one up there. Could you just wait for the mic coming through? Hi, I'm Lindy Pot. I'm a grazier from Jurong, west of Kingaroy. Um, but I, we grow crops as well. The seed that's having all these issues, is it inoculated? The, so grain, the grains that's getting these fungus and diseases, are the seed, is it no, inoculated seed or not? It, do, you mean, do you mean with a uh, chemical fungicide? Yeah. Yes. Oh, the, the fungicide resistant ones? No, any of them. The ones that are getting the diseases, are they all inoculated? Because we have, we've had a less, lot less trouble with disease with in, not inoculated seed than what everyone is with inoculated. So I'm just wondering. <laughs> well, it, it, hmm? Oh, seed dressings. Um, well, the, the stuff that we use is not seed dressed, obviously, because we wanted to um, produce disease. Um, it is seed borne, so possibly the disease, the seed is infected. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure with treatment. I, sorry, I can't answer that question. Any other questions? Okay, well, we might move on to the next presentation. Thanks very much, Anka. Thank you. The next presentation was uh, to be presented by Dr. Levante Kiss. Unfortunately, Dr. Kiss has been called away um, and can't be with us today, and he apologises that he has asked me to present on his behalf. Um, so, I'll be able to present. Um, we uh, have others in the room, such as Lisa and, uh, and also Noel, who may be able to ask some of your more in-depth questions. But I'll try to cover off on what information that uh, Levente has left me. So we're talking about fungicide resistance, and that comes down to one of the questions that you are asking a little bit or could have an effect on, on uh, what the seed dressing effects are actually having on uh, pathogens. As we uh, all know, um, in our environment, antimicrobials, uh, antibiotics and pesticides, and resistance to those is becoming a really big issue for us, for all of us. Fungicides are like any other chemical that we would use. There's an opportunity for resistance to evolve from those, to those fungicides, uh, from the pathogens. So we've got to understand what's there now and what could happen in the future so that we can put into place mitigation strategies that allow us to manage that fungicide resistance. On the bottom of that uh, slide there, you may not be able to see it, it's probably a little bit small, but it's, it's basically saying that when we put a fungicide on a crop, we don't kill all of the fungi that are present. We will kill the majority of them. Some of those may escape, but some of them may also be resistant. So if we do apply it and we get some resistant ones, if we apply that same fungicide the following year to that same population, we will get more resistance. And so this is a way to leading through and getting more resistance within a population. So the main goals for this BACI project were to develop laboratory protocols that could be used to detect fungicide resistance and look at some of the DNA markers. So we're, we're building capability at the university to make sure that we can provide that type of service to the industry and also to monitor the baseline fungicide sensitivities in a number of broadacre crops. We need to know what's out there, we need to know where we're at at the moment, and that will inform our decisions going forward. So to do this, I'm going to present three case studies. The first one is for DNA markers for resistance to two fungicide groups detected in mung bean powdery mildew populations, and that's in, in uh, southern Queensland. We're looking at a suspected case of fungicide resistance in barley loose smut samples, and these were had uh, seed dressing on them. 
and we're also looking for DNA markers for resistance to two fungicide groups detected in barley net blotch samples. So moving to case study one, powdery mildew. And as you probably all know, uh, this is one of Levente's favourite pathogens. He loves a good powdery mildew. Uh, the, disease, the management of powdery mildew in mung bean relies very heavily on the use of fungicides. Early uh, fungicide usage, uh, multiple fungicide usage, probably two applications in particularly bad years. So this is a, a, a crop and a pathogen that are primed for fungicide resistance if we're not careful in what we're doing. Two fungicides are available under permit. Uh, one's a group three and the other one is a combination of group three and a group 11 fungicide. So these are the groups that these fall into. 100% disease control is never achieved in these crops. So there is always the pathogen moving from one population to the next. So from one year to the next or from one spray to the next. That's one of the complicating factors. One of the other complicating factors is that a group here at UniSQ and the DAF collaborators have found that powdery mildew isn't all just powdery mildew. There are two different species, two different genera of fungi, totally different. Levente told me he can't tell them apart on a leaf. So if he can't tell them apart, they're very difficult to tell apart but they are two different species. So how do these react to different fungicides? How do they react to different hosts? These are questions we really don't have answers to. However, there, have been, there has been some work that's looked at over 30 paddocks uh, in experimental sites in central and southern Queensland from 2019 to 2023 using DNA markers that are available here at the University of Southern Queensland, we've been able to find resistance markers. So there are populations that are resistant <coughs> excuse me, to both of these fungicides uh, within those populations. So as Levy has said there with his little red flag, this is a red flag for us. We know that there are now the potential for fungicide resistance to both of those fungicides. So both group three and group 11. How frequent do these populations actually occur? We don't know. And this is the work of uh, Aisha, who's going to be a PhD, or is a current, sorry, is a current master's student. I've already promoted you, Aisha. Um, as a uh, master's student who is actually in, in the process of looking at this within the field. Second case study is around barley loose smut. And as we know, barley loose smut is carried within the seed from season to season. There was an example where there was suspected fungicide resistance because there was a failure of seed dressing and we were actually getting uh, barley loose smut where we shouldn't have got it when we had seed dressing. This is a suspected case. So the group here have actually looked at that and have applied fungicide very, very precisely to the seed and they didn't get any of the disease coming through. They've also not been able to find any of the known fungicide resistance loci within the, the genome of the fungus. So this looks like it's a false positive. So we aren't actually, we don't actually have fungicide resistance here, but we had to test for it because we were thinking this could have been a, a problem. So it's, it's a good story. It's a, an opportunity to look at that and say, well, we don't have fungicide resistance. And lastly, we have a photo of, of Noel. No, actually, uh, we have our case study number three, um, where we're looking at resistance to DMIs, uh, group three, and SDHIs, group seven fungicides in barley in net botch populations. And 
a UNESQ internal capacity building grant uh, in conjunction with BACI funding has allowed us to work with the CCDM, which is a uh, centre for disease management in Western Australia, to detect DNA markers of resistance to both fungicide groups in these Queensland populations. So we have fungicide resistance in Queensland. This is a, a map of fungicide resistance locations that has been supplied through one of the publications of GRDC. And as you can see there, that there has been fungicide resistance found throughout the states. There appear to be smaller occurrences of fungicide resistance in Queensland. However, that may be that we're not actually sampling enough. And this has allowed us to build that capability so we can do more of that sampling, which will further inform the uh, farming community. So the take home message is that we have developed state of the art technologies here for uh, looking for fungicide resistance. We have unfortunately found that fungicide resistance is resident within populations that it hasn't been found in before in some of the broad acre crops uh, in Queensland. And we need to look at strategies because we are on time. It hasn't, the horse hasn't bolted yet, but we can put into place some of these fungicide resistance management strategies to make sure that we can keep that disease, that, that fungicide resistance under control. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, the numbers of people who have been involved in this, both from industry and from research partners, and you'll see that those uh, research partners are, are from across the country, and there has been a very wide collaboration uh, with BACI, with GRDC funded projects, with a number of different research organisations. And who do you go to? Uh, so uh, I'd like you to make sure that, I'll go back to that one, no, yep, uh, that you contact Levy. Le Le he will be back at work tomorrow, no doubt. Um, or Lisa Kelly, if you have any in-depth questions. Or if you'd like to ask a question now, ask Noel. Okay, I think we might, I won't take any questions now. I think that's given us an opportunity to catch up. We're now back on time. Um, so without any further ado, I'll ask Dante Adorata to come forward and give us a presentation on diseases of sesame. Thanks, Dante. Thanks, Gavin. Sesame. I would assume that not, not many of you know what sesame plant looks like. So today I'll be talking about sesame and its diseases. Sesame is one of the oldest oil seed crop. We use it a lot in cooking, confectionery, uh, sesame oil, making bread. However, we don't have much sesame being grown in Australia. Majority of our sesame seed and sesame products are imported, amounting to close to 57 million uh, per annum. Uh, Australia is in a good position to go into commercial production of sesame. Um, it, sesame is a heat and drought tolerant um, crop that has the potential to be a high value summer cropping alternate to a grain growers. It could be a rotation crop during summer on uh, broad, acre, uh, broad acre crops. It can also tap into existing farming systems infrastructure. Uh, at the moment, sesame is being grown in uh, northwestern Australia, the Northern Territory, and um, uh, Northern uh, Queensland. Success in producing sesame here in Australia depends on several factors. One of them is uh, the existence of diseases. So the question is, are there any economically important diseases of sesame that could limit its production here in Queensland? And that brings us to the um, Bucky, in, Bucky Initiative 
in 2021, the research that we, we, we conducted, first we look into the literatures on what could be the potential diseases of uh, sesame. In, uh, in literatures, globally, there are 30 reported diseases. So we've conducted as well small plot trials here in the, in the downs on six different uh, trap crop plots, and we found four common diseases, which are also common on summer broad acre crops, namely charcoal rot, fusarium wilt, alternaria lip spot, and philodi. This Baki initiative has resulted into collaborative uh, networks. We are now uh, working with CRCNA for their grow, Great Northern Spices project. We're also working with AgriFutures on their project on scaling up production of sesame, not just in Queensland, but in the whole of Australia. We're also now a member of the Australian Sesame Industry Development Association. In August, the Sesame Central was launched. This hub put together all um, stakeholders involved in developing a sustainable and viable sesame industry, again, not just in Queensland, but in the whole of Australia. And it involves UNESQ and DAF participation in this collaboration. The, the objective of developing this uh, sesame industry focuses on three research themes th that involves uh, post-harvest, led by DAF, uh, crop production, by C uh, UNESQ as well being involved, nutrient and irrigation water management, farming systems and modeling, southern production, and crop establishment and harvesting mechanization. The, the current Baki project we're working on right now, uh, we still continue disease surveillance and we're developing a disease database for Queensland. We're also looking into um, existence of uh, resistance on lines being introduced here in Australia against different fungal diseases, namely charcoal rot, fusarium wilt, target spot, and alternaria leaf spot. We're also evaluating commercially available fungicides against uh, fungal diseases. Since we are proposing such sesame to be a rotation crop, we're looking into uh, the Test, testing the pathogenicity of charcoal rot and other diseases isolated from other crops onto sesame to see how it performs. And we're also uh, evaluating indigenous bio, uh, biocontrol agents against a treatment, a seed treatment against uh, charcoal rot and fusarium wilt. In, in summary, leveraging on these uh, Baki research uh, initiatives has led to further involvement in other sesame-related research. It has resulted as well in research collaboration and has helped to better understand diseases of sesame in Queensland. So the plan now is to integrate all these uh, outputs from the different projects and deliver, uh, to be delivered in support of uh, developing a sesame industry in Queensland. We would like to acknowledge the uh, contribution of several individuals and groups in this project. People from DAF uh, who assisted in identification and in the storage of isolates that were generated from this project. We've got people from Agribentis and uh, Savannah Agrifoods who provided the seeds that we use for the different experiments. My uh, UNESQ colleagues who helped, who assisted in uh, setting up experiments. The agronomists who linked me to the different growers uh, to participate in this uh, 
research, and most importantly, the growers who allowed me to set up my experiments in their properties and allowed me to access their properties when I was doing surveillance and collecting uh, disease specimens. Thank you all, and if you have any questions, you could email me on that address. Or you can ask now if you like. So Dante, of all of those pathogens that you've looked at and you found, which is the, do you think, has the greatest potential to uh, damage the sesame crop in Australia? I would say charcoal rot, because it's always present and, and it's present in most products and all of uh, the summer broadacre crops, even in where areas you're planting uh, winter cereals, although winter cereals are not affected that much by charcoal rot. So is that the same charcoal rot that's occurring in uh, sorghum, for example? That's one study that we're doing right now. Uh, a, a study by uh, one of my colleagues has shown differences based on their genetic makeup. So there are groupings now that shows that some of the uh, charcoal rot are uh, affecting only a specific group of, of crops. Great, thank you. Any questions from the audience? Yes, one from the centre there. Hey Dante, what are, what are the nature of this indigenous biocontrol that you've, you've identified? So, uh, right now what, we're, what we've done with that indigenous uh, um, biocontrol agents that we've isolated, these are from different soil, from northern New South Wales, southern Queensland, all the way to central Queensland, we've isolated those trichoderma. See, the, the thing about uh, biocontrol is that I, some, some growers are hesitant in applying uh, biocontrol because they think that they'll be introducing something new. Uh, one of my colleagues from the Northern Territory said that it should be isolated from where it's going to be applied. So I think the indigenous uh, idea of putting in what's n uh, native there or indigenous there is the way to go. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dante. So our next speaker uh, to today is Dr. Cassandra Percy, uh, and she'll also be assisted by Yee Yee. So uh, over to you, Cassie, to tell us a little bit more about common root rot. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. So today I'll be presenting our BACI project on the detection and impact of common root rot in Queensland winter cereals. So common root rot is a soil-borne fungal disease which is difficult to detect in the field. Above ground, the crops may lack vigour, have reduced tillering, heads may be smaller and the crop may be pale in colour. However, below ground, the lesions on the subcrown internode and root systems are the distinctive characteristics of this disease. These symptoms are very similar to the crown rot disease and the two are often um, confused with each other. So accurate identification requires pathogen isolation and de or DNA detection. Common root rot is estimated to cause between 6 and 25% yield loss in wheat varieties. However, it's generally accepted to be taking 10% yield each year across Australia. In 2018-2019, common root rot pathogen was detected in 95% of paddocks surveyed in southeast Queensland. This data was provided by Stephen Simpendorfer as part of the National Paddock Survey supported by GRDC. <coughs> And 67% of these paddocks also contained both crown rot and common root rot pathogens together. 
Common varietal resistance has also declined in recent years. In 2015, 30% of wheat varieties and all durum varieties had some levels of resistance to common root rot. However, in 2021, all wheat and barley varieties were at least moderately susceptible to very susceptible to common root rot. So this has led to the question, what is the impact of this increased incidence and reduced resistance to common root rot in Queensland? To answer this, this project first aimed to determine what the actual yield loss is in Queensland varieties of wheat and barley. So we've been conducting plus and minus inoculated yield loss trials across the last three years <clears throat> looking at all of the wheat and barley varieties available to Queensland growers. <clears throat> in 2021, of the 64 varieties tested, 31% lost yield, sorry, 31 varieties lost yield, with four varieties having yield losses greater than 10% and 15% the highest yield loss in one bread variety. In 2022, 36 of the 52 varieties tested lost yield, and we had five varieties had greater than 10%, with 24% in one durum variety and 22% in one barley variety. Both these seasons were characterised by unusually high in-crop rainfall and cooler, milder conditions. So we are interested to see what this drier, warmer season will bring us this year in our 50 varieties that are currently being screened. As part of these experiments, we've also been collecting data on establishment and sampling plants to look at plant agronomy and the disease severity of the plants to associate that back to the yield loss that we're seeing. <clears throat> the second part of this project has been looking at the common root rot pathogen aggressiveness. Isolates of common root rot have been collected from Queensland fields um, and these isolates have been provided from the DAF pathology herbarium and also from Stephen Simfendorfer from the National Paddock Surveys and Grower Diagnostic Samples. And we've taken each of these isolates and tested their ability to cause common root rot. Of the 35 isolates that we've tested as part of this BACI project, we've had a range of responses across the bread wheat varieties. You can see in this image from the left hand side, there's just slight discolorations on the lower parts of the plants, moving across to the right hand side where you have a highly susceptible response to common root rot, where the lesions on the stems, the leaf tissue and subcrown internodes are quite significant. You'll also notice a reduction in the very slight reduction in the, in the height of the plants and also in the um, a severe reduction in the size of the root ball. Of the isolates that have been tested so far, 85% have um, been shown to be in the moderately to highly susceptible range. This research is now being undertaken by our new UniSQ post PhD student, Akila Dende. Akila will continue to investigate new isolates in wheat, as well as look at the variation in, um, of the pathogen in barley varieties. Akila is also um, not only undertaking this research in, in the seedling trials, but she's also taken it to the field. And you can see in this image from one of her trials this year, the significant um, impact that common root rot can have on establishment for the three isolates that have been tested here compared to the control variety on the left hand side. I would now like to introduce Yi Yi Ziong, who's going to talk to us about her PhD, which is supported by this BACI project. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Yi, so it's my pleasure to be here showing you guys my research on detection of non-visual common root rot disease in wheat. 
So my research aim is to develop automated sensing technique using near-infrared and multi-spectral imaging with multiple uh, machine learning algorithms and uh, vegetation indices to detect the common root rot during the early infection stage. Let's look at the methodology behind the research. Um, well, as we all know, the current traditional method for disease detection is using human eye to scout the disease in the field. Um, it's time consuming and also prone to inaccuracies due to optical illusions. Um, of course, it's limited within the visible uh, light spectrum. So we introduced a new equipment um, that extend beyond the visible light spectrum into the non-visible light spectrum. Um, so using such as a uh, multi-spectral sensor and uh, near-infrared sensor. So in the field, we fly the drone attached with multi-spectral sensor to take images every week. Um, and at the same time, we use the point NIR sensor to do the leaf measurement. Um, after conducting two seasons of glass house and three seasons of field trials, the results are promising. Um, firstly, we've developed a novel um, deep neural net network model customized for common root rot detection, um, achieving around average 80% accuracy um, in both glass house and field trials. And um, secondly, um, we are able to detect common root rot as early as tillowing stage around 40 days after sowing, so before the visual symptoms appear. And lastly, um, these findings can help farmers to make the um, well-informed and timely management decision about, um, about in crop input and future variety and uh, crop selections. And the most important part of my research is that the technology I develop um, can help the farmers to map the disease level and um, give, the give the growers ability to um, minimize the impact of this disease. And thank you for your attention. Now I'm going to hand over the stage to Cassie. So just one final aim of this project is that we will be looking at develop, um, looking at the common root rot spectral signatures that Yi Yi's just described and comparing them with the previously identified common root rot spectral signatures which were um, identified as part of Jacob Humpel's PhD here at UniSQ and looking to determine if remote sensing techniques are disease specific and whether we can differentiate these pathogens in the field. So this project aims to develop a clear understanding of common root rot resistance and yield penalty in Queensland wheat and barley varieties, to determine the variation in the pathogen um, and to develop sensing systems to detect common root rot. And finally, to determine if the spectral signatures for common root rot and crown rot um, are different and this could be used as a proof of concept tool for growers to be able to detect these pathogens and map them as you said in the field. So I'd like to thank many people who have been involved in this project. Firstly the Queensland Government and the University of Southern Queensland for supporting the research. I'd like to acknowledge the DAF farm staff for all their hard work in planting and harvesting our field trials. Um, you pay 10 from the DAF plant pathology herbarium and Stephen Zunferdorfer for providing isolates and also like to thank the UniSQ team for, for working with us on the project too. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cassie. Do we have any questions for Cassie or for Yee? So I suppose I have one for Yi Yi. Um, your neural network model that you feed your multispectral drone images, how fast is it able to achieve its 
uh, results for 80% accuracy? Is it able to do that in real time or is there a lot of back-end processing for that? Um, you mean the time? So it's, it's, it takes a little bit of time to process the data, of course, but for me, I think it's quite fast. So it's not, because it's the NIR, NIR spectrum, so it's not really imagey, so it's faster than you thought. So it, I think it's pretty reliable and fast. 80% accuracy, I think it's pretty good compared to other, because the common root road is not very, it's not visual symptom, it's because common root road doesn't have visual, uh, distinct visual symptoms, so it's, so when we achieve 80% compared to other 90% of other yellow spots, it's a visual disease, it's pretty good. Yeah. Another question here. Go this one here first and then up the back. Thanks, Cassie. Um, I guess I'm chasing a bit of a comment that the survey, paddock survey work says there's a lot of root rot out in the paddock, mm. yet our varieties are dropping in their resistance. Do you think that's because the breeding teams aren't selecting out in the paddocks as much anymore and they're doing it more glasshouse, rapid um, phenotyping type work? Oh, um, <laughs> that, that certainly could contribute to the loss in resistance. Um, I don't think that common root rot's actually a focus of the breeding companies. So, um, and maybe the, if, if the trials were conducted um, out in the field, then you could be indirectly selecting for these sorts of diseases. But I think when breeders are developing varieties and looking for specific um, disease traits, you'd, you'd want to have that controlled so you're not interfering with your, <laughs> with your selection process. So I think there's a, a little bit of both sides could go there. Yeah, it's, it's not a simple answer, but um, there, 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 it does appear that the trend is towards greater or less resistance, uh, and we're starting to realise how important common root rot could actually be within the farming system. Mm. I've got Cassie. I've got one here and then back up to... Um, I had a question. So, great that you can de detect crown, uh, common root rot early in the field. What timely management decisions would you offer to growers if you can detect it so early? Yeah. Can we take that off? Um, so, I guess the management for common root rot in field is really limited to just... Um, applying, you know, adequate fertilisers and, and if available water management and things like that or growers may choose to actually um, not take it through and, and, um, and go to hay or something. So I, get, I think the real value is in management across seasons um, and being able to make sort of variety and crop choices um, going forward. <clears throat> and then also being able to actually monitor how your management practices are, um, how, how they're working. So if you can actually map these paddocks for these diseases, which are really difficult to see visually, then it'll allow them to have more information about what's going on in their paddocks below ground. I like disease work because you get really, really nice photos out of it. Um, so nice, nice project. Um, the detection system or the detection method, is that um, detecting presence or absence or is that actually giving a, um, a threshold or an amount of amount that's there? Um, so the detection, it's detection, not quantification at this okay. stage. Yep. Cool. Thanks. No Any other questions? We've got one more up the back there. All right, thank you so much. Which tool did you use in neural network? Is TensorFlow or something like that? Uh, yes, it's TensorFlow. Okay, thank you. That was an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do know that we've got uh, Jacob Humpel up the back there. Jacob, would you like to make a comment on the differentiation of crown rot and uh, common root rot through spectral s images? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so we're, I guess what I'm most excited about with this work is, is to actually um, 
look to when we can compare some of the work that was previously done in my PhD um, to the signatures that Yee's um, pulled together to see if we're actually getting um, a true differentia differentiation or if we're getting more of a general, um, I guess, yield indicator, so general stress indicator. Thanks very much. Any other last questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank, I'd like to thank our vice president. Our uh, next presenter is uh, Derek Long, uh, and Derek is uh, preparing a field here for you to make sure that uh, he can show you what he can do with his phone. Uh, so over to you, Derek. Hello, everyone. Thank you for letting me have some prep. I'm a sucker for doing show and tell when I can. Uh, I get to pick up from some of the tone. Sorry. Going up to two live mics. I'd like to pick up from the tone from Yee's presentation about doing, um, improving our sensing work and giving us more power to detect and decide and to action on our crops. And that's um, the general spirit of another Baki project that I'd like to present for you now. Uh, this is about tapping into the potential that recent developments in smartphones are allowing us to do to learn more and gather more data more quickly about, uh, about crops and to not only just make things faster for kinds of measurements that we already take, but in some instances maybe even enable brand new measurements that we'd like to do but previously weren't really practical. The key technology that I'm looking to integrate here is augmented reality, bringing that into doing smartphone measurement. My background's in computer vision, and I've got a fair bit of experience at this point applying that across various um, projects in the ag sector. And I see a lot of potential in marrying up the additional, in addition to looking through the camera and taking a photo and having that tell us something about a plant, throwing augmented reality in on top of that. What that lets the phone do is not just um, see, but map 3D space at the same time. So the beginning of this project was some fundamental work, trying to marry those two technologies together, which I think is really quite a novel application for this. I then moved to doing a, single, uh, a simpler single application, which was plan emergence, which is something that was um, very practical to take on as a first step, because the computer vision component is quite light and then moving into more advanced crop-specific measurements. So I'll show a little bit about them. Now, um, plant emergence, it sounds very simple, just count, what, counting plants and, and taking down the distance, but it's quite useful as a measurement for both growers and for researchers. On the grower side, it's useful potentially for informing a replant decision if they know that their plant emergence isn't so great, but turning that into a decision, do I um, do something about that or not? There are existing decision support tools that kind of um, can assist in, in some, um, for some crops. And this would be a great way to collect that information much, uh, much more easily. There is the availability to do some of these things via, say, drone mapping. But I think there's a lot more convenience in just being able to whip your phone out and do it on the spot. On the researcher side, this plays into taking measurements relating to maybe various treatments. We even saw that um, uh, plant emergence was being taken as a measurement in the previous presentation. So in that instance, they might not just be looking at how many plants over what distance do I have, but they might even look to analyze the distribution of, those, of the spacing between those plants. And so there's um, some things that are a little tedious that growers and researchers do that we could make a lot, lot faster. I'll flick over, live on the wild side and try it live. Um, so let's imagine I'm out in the field at the moment and I've brought um, some uh, succulents. This will be, uh, be my crop and I've got them in a the line and I've got some pretend weeds here as well. So when I turn on the augmented reality and, and mapping 3D space, I could be doing this to draw like a square area and we'll look at that as well, but also just walking in a line. 
or am I? So hopefully I think I've placed those out somewhere maybe a little over two metres. So I think if it's working right, we'll see on the screen that there's four plants in the one and it's like over 2.2, 2.5 metres or something. So I've got a crosshair. And I can just start walking along. Do you see the green dot on top of the plant as well? My estimate was a bit off. Lucky I had the phone. 1.8. So in that, there's computer vision, which is uh, detecting and discriminating from within the weeds as well. So there's the ability to kind of ignore what's not in the row, but we can handle a bit what's in the row as well and then mapping distance. So I'll, uh, there was a more dedicated trial around that as well that I'll show results of. But just while I've got the phone on live, I'll do something with a virtual square meter too. Bring this out. Um, let's pretend this is my front yard. Actually, this, my front yard is not that green. We'll pretend it's my neighbors. Um, putting down a virtual square meter. So this could play into things such as um, uh, pasture assessment. Um, I've seen, um, I haven't uh, done myself, but I've, I've noted that there are some uh, data collection practices where people are physically taking out a giant square and placing it down on the ground and looking what's inside. So if I go to square meter, I'll come over here. I can look at it exactly what's inside the square, mapping that as a virtual square meter. It went up the stairs there, so I'm going to just start it again. So red numbers say if I was looking at soil, and then as I move that over, the green goes up to close to 100%. Walking forward, you hopefully see, see those numbers tracking. It's taking exactly what's in that square meter and then telling us a bit about what's inside. And then if I take it over that weed as well, the numbers haven't lined up too well for me, but the teal number on the far right is saying what percentage of that area is weed. So a couple of percent there as I walk back over those succulents. So I'm, I'm looking at kind of three classes, if you will, there. Soil, I'll, I'll flip back uh, to the slides, thank you. Uh, looking at soil, grass, and, and weeds. And in practice, there would need to be more to that, but um, that's just the indoor demonstration, if you will, of the kinds of things our smartphone can do. I'll just um, tell you a little bit quickly about the more dedicated trial around um, the, the line walking. Uh, I had a, uh, a maize crop where we simulated high, medium, and low plant stands. So taking high is just what was already planted and uh, inducing medium and low plant emergence by pulling some out and some clean rows where I had no weeds to deal with and some weeds as well. So what we found over walking a 10 meter length, the error in that positional tracking only really varied by about 10 centimeters over a 10 meter distance, or plus or minus 1% really. That's um, quite, power, uh, quite accurate and a good show of that the uh, kinds of 3D mapping that they're building into phones is really fit for purpose for us in an outdoor setting. Um, there's uh, really, the, it got the numbers quite right when it was looking at um, getting plant counts when there were no weeds. And I'm kind of outing myself here that I've got a little bit of work to do when I've got weeds in and dealing properly, particularly when they're in row, with um, making sure it counts only the crop. I'll let that play just to show. So I think this is going to be one of those runs where it's about of maybe one of those where it's about 15. And you'll see that go to 10 meters over the end of it. So again, to restress, this is something that we're already currently doing or people already currently take these forms of measurements, but there's a lot more power to do it quicker and to take in more information, like if they wanted to analyze the distribution of spacings. I might cut it off there, actually, just to move on. I, I grabbed this from um, one of our, our old social media posts. Um, and hopefully, I was going to put up with the words, hopefully, hopefully the past or, or hopefully no more. Um, we're moving towards a future where we can do things a bit better. 
Um, looking at other applications, so with the plan emergence, next trials for that will be in sorghum. Um, there's also applications, I think, for the virtual square meter looking at analyzing wheat. So um, uh, I understand um, uh, colleagues in the space go out and do um, disease scoring in this, where they're looking at the percentage of area or the percentage of heads that are white heads, which are shown up in here. So again, that's a manual measurement that's just taken on person, um, someone's judgment. And doing that through um, something like a smartphone app, if it's capable, has the benefits not just of speed, but of also of standardizing between people's judgment. So it might be that and a very experienced researcher and a student that they're bringing along might make different judgments about um, doing some forms of manual scoring. So that's another benefit of bringing technology in here. Um, I'd like to just finish by acknowledging the uh, other team members that have been on the project, so Craig Bailey, Jacob Humble, and Corey Plant from within the university, but also um, uh, uh, fellows from DAF have been very uh, supportive and willing to um, share where um, and guide where some of those key use cases are for seeing impact with this kind of technology. I really think, um, and um, with YEEs as well, these are, this is very novel work and is uh, going to be a real part of how we can better micromanage our plants and animals and be part of iterating through improving agricultural productivity. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Derek. Do we have any questions for Derek? Yes, we've had one down the front here. Derek, I think that's great. And uh, one, I want to know when it's available because I've got a plant population trial going in very shortly. So, uh, <laughs> and if you're looking for a sorghum plot to come and test it on, uh, I'm open to offers. Fantastic. Derek, I'd accept that. Yeah. <laughs> Paul McIntosh here, Derek. How are you again, mate? Well, thanks. Mate, uh, don't worry about Kerry McKenzie. He's from New South Wales. He'll take his shoes off if he gets past 10 for plant counts in here. Derek, you've got the plants per metre of row, but some of the things with our summer crops is the spacing of those particular plants in that metre of row. I saw something up there about spacing. Where do you think you might be able to go to that part of the equation rather than just counting number of plants per 10 metres of row? So the, the logging in that process is we, we don't just have a number of here's how many plants have come and here's how far I've walked. Every single um, interplant distance is recorded there. So if, that, um, if there's statistical analysis around that that's useful, all of that information's already, already being captured. So um, when it comes to, like say, um, working with sorghum uh, very shortly, that'll be, again, trying to um, see where the opportunities are with that statistical analysis will be one of my next steps. I'd encourage you to have a chat to him and help to drive the direction of the research in, to solve your problems. Uh, thank you, Derek. I was wondering, um, do you also consider trialing tractor mounting those kind of applications? Like particularly with regards to the row, because one can, of course... Very good question. Yeah. I can only answer that um, my activities in vehicle-based stuff is already tied up. And so this is smartphone-only based work. Any further questions at this stage? Yes, one up the back there. Oh, no. Very nice presentation, Derek. Right. Um, you've tested it on maize, hopefully maybe testing it on sorghum. Yep. We might not let you cross the border, though. Um, how small can we get this? Can I use this to do a plant count for medics? So I think wheat would be... So cotton, maize, sorghum, wheat would be a, um, a harder use case, or uh, yes. So there's more dense crops we could look at. Um, I'm pretty optimistic. We've, we've done uh, untested, so I can't confirm, but there are um, computer vision techniques, not just grouping together um, green pixels, but separating overlap between groups. So broadly speaking, if we can visually see it, somebody with enough skill can make a computer see it too, um, that within limits. But there are um, 
uh, there are computer vision techniques that I'm aware of to separate out where you've got some pretty dense, some pretty dense crop, but really to be tested. Great, thank you very much. I think we might wrap it up there. Thanks very much, Derek. Sure. Our next presentation um, is from Quentin and Justine, who will be talking about um, smart state farming and taking what we've seen and making it bigger. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name's Quentin Ferry Lawrence. I work with DAF up at the Central Queensland Smart Cropping Centre, and my role with the centre is Technology Solutions Architect. And with me is... Hi, Justine Bailey, University of Southern Queensland. So I'm in our School of Agricultural and Environmental Science um, and Program Director for our Bachelor of Ag Tech and Management. So the Central Queensland Smart Cropping Centre is located uh, up in Emerald. It's a former QATC Ag College and is now a DAF run facility. Um, we have 430 hectares of broadacre cropping, uh, including grains, pulses, and hopefully some cotton in the future. Um, we are envisioning the centre as a for industry, by industry facility, and we're focusing on on-farm technologies such as automation, uh, remote sensing and climate adaptive farming systems. Um, we've been working very closely with industry, uh, engaging with growers, universities, research organisations to better understand what the needs are for the future of uh, agriculture and enhancing our RDNE capabilities. Um, what we really want to do though is demonstrate how that technology can be used, uh, how we can capture data from crops over historical periods and help inform future decisions through that uh, data-driven decision-making. There we go. So in terms of getting this project up and running, um, the University of Southern Queensland was involved through, through the, the BACI initiative to, to provide some guidance in the initial stages. And, and what we were here to do was to, to basically identify those potential technologies that could, could underpin the development of this facility. Um, at this point, I'd like to also just acknowledge that there was quite a large team involved in that, quite a few of them who are sitting here in the audience at the moment. Um, so Craig, Craig Bailey, Jake Humpel, Derek Longer here, as well as others from, from the University of Southern Queensland who were involved. We went through a bit of a process where it was a really a, a co-design type project. It wasn't one where we went away, developed the roadmap and then presented it. Um, instead, it was really about a bit of a, a journey of discovery as, as we went along. Um, so it meant involving sort of going and doing that initial technology scan, you know, thinking about what could be implemented and having that, that ongoing dialogue um, with, with DAF and, and the broader stakeholders to identify the best, best way forward. So that there was sort of a, a number of stages of, of having that co-design occur. There were a few key elements in terms of achieving that aim. The first one was really thinking about the tools of the trade, so understanding that the sort of current technology landscape uh, and what could be implemented now. Um, the other thing to think about is it's not necessarily about solving new problems, it's about even taking the understandings that you've got of your cropping systems and looking at how you use technology to augment it. So again, it's, it's that understanding, you know, the current insights that you already have, but how you, can you use technology to do things faster, more precise, more efficiently. And it's a different way of thinking when we normally think about research projects. It's not necessarily about solving um, a, 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 you know, an agronomic problem, for example. It might be that you already have that insights, but how do you do, use technology to enhance your operations? So it's a little bit of a different mindset that needs to be thought about. It also involved um, going through a process of identifying what those future R&D use cases might be that, that might be getting explored on, on um, the smart farm and there'll be some, some more talk about maybe what those priorities might be. Um, but also thinking about the enablers and again, you know, that there's a lot beyond just the technology that's needed to enable a smart farm. 
so our role was really about starting to sort of lay that, that foundation with some of the thinking. Um, the next bit Quentin will talk to you about is really what's happened since and the exciting thing about this has been how much of a live project has been and how it's, it's really developed. Thank you Justine. Um, so from the initial report that was uh, put out by the Baki project, it has identified the targeted technology investments uh, around what the foundational technologies are, uh, recommendations to the upgrades to the infrastructure, so your field layouts, irrigation, roads, whatnot, and also investments into machinery, both existing and new machinery as well. So what can we do on what we've already got to modernise it? And what are the new U-Butte uh, best-in-class solutions that are coming to the market to uh, definitely look at uh, acquiring. Uh, in addition to that, the key operational areas were around establishing that baseline data, so getting an idea of where you are coming from, where you're starting from, it's really important. You've got to uh, put that in place, just like the foundations of uh, the technologies, you've got to have the foundational data. Uh, improving our remote sensing capability, so identifying those areas where we want to be capturing data what are the important bits and what are the less important areas and also how we can also use that with uh, the crop phenotyping capabilities we're starting to see come to more mature stages of development. Um, we've also done a lot of work around building capacity within our own staff so change is always a challenge particularly when there's new technology being involved and changing the way you're looking at doing research so we've been doing what we can to uplift and build the skills capabilities and knowledge within our team at the center to enable this uh, as mentioned earlier we are working very closely with industry uh, particularly manufacturers technology providers and also uh, research partners around what we need to be doing and what's working what's not working to provide that uh, validation step and identify some of the problems we may have. So part of that collaboration was back in November we ran a co-design day at the facility. Uh, we had about 80 attendees from across industry come together and put down all the problems, all the challenges they're facing and what they would like the facility to be. And through some work that was done through Sparrow Lee in developing a strategic action plan, we've identified the key impact areas for what CQSCC can be, which is around the environmental friendly, environment friendly farming systems, data driven farming systems, market ready farming systems, autonomous farming systems, AI enabled research, workforce development, and an innovation, innovation ecosystem to bring everyone together into this uh, place of learning and advancing agriculture. We also went on a tour around uh, different smart farms around the country. Um, we went to the Bars facility down in New South Wales looking at what they've done there with their infield crop phenotyping uh, units. We visited the Tatura and Horsham smart farms down in Victoria where they had this really really cool uh, unit you can see pictured in the top left there which actually was attached to a diesel generator to heat up a section of crop to look at the uh, climate impacts. And down in South Australia, the Nuriopta demonstration farm was really, really interesting in the way they were working with ag tech providers and industry to get their products onto the site to test and demonstrate them. We haven't seen that anywhere else uh, across the country. And most recently, uh, Western Australia was a particularly great visit. We visited a couple of research facilities there and the key thing that we noticed was there was a great amount of investment in these research facilities to enable that enhancement, that step forward in what we're doing in terms of agricultural research. So what makes a smart farm? Well, research is definitely an important part of it. Um, one thing we found was every site we visited had a very, very clear and specific research focus. Um, there were facilities that would just do grains, there were facilities that were focused on livestock, there were facilities that were looking at pest and disease. And having that focus definitely keeps you in that lane, the key area. It is really easy to kind of spread out a bit too far and spread yourself thin. So everyone having that focus was really important. The technology as well, enabling that research, 
we saw a variety of different solutions across different sites, some very similar to the paths we've gone down, and some that are completely different direction, but it was really interesting to see them as well around how that decision has impacted the outcome versus the different paths undertaken. Um, as well, a lot of the sites had very close partnerships with universities, research organisations, grow groups, and working very closely with them to identify the current and upcoming challenges. And most importantly was the people at each of those sites. Having the passion, drive and innovation uh, with every single member of the staff of those facilities is what was pushing them forwards. Uh, the willingness to want to adopt and use this technology and having the skills and knowledge to do so, it is incredibly vital. So I spoke about foundational technologies. Um, definitely from our experiences, looking at the connectivity, the data, and the analytics side of things, I think they're the three key pillars of what a smart farm or facility should look like. But also in addition to that, the geo-referencing of the site, the farm management software as well is just as equally important. So from the back of your report, we started a little journey of our own and developed our ag tech infrastructure development plan where this lovely little diagram came from. Um, and this has kind of highlighted those key areas where looking at implementing technology on our site. In terms of connectivity, our site's uh, in an area where we do have relatively good LTE or 4G connectivity to Telstra or other service providers. So some of the areas where you, know, you might have private LTE solutions weren't really valid. However, what we did look at is how could we get connectivity to where we need it without needing to rely on these networks to enable higher speed data transfers and also reduce costs in operating. So what we did, we became our own internet service provider by setting up a series of point-to-point -point links, which is supported by a backhaul service, which is either connected to Firebar, Starlink, you name it. And the reason we went down this point way was because for most growers, if they want to implement a solution, they usually go look at a service provider or they look at what they can do themselves. And as Starlink has evidently shown, it's a really kind of uplifting technology which has a lot of benefits to. And a lot of growers are usually on that forefront of trying to adopt new technology to see how it can benefit their operations. So demonstrating this by buying off-the-shelf solutions, implementing them ourselves, and then providing that information and feedback to growers is a really valuable point of what we can do at the centre because it's solving the connectivity problem yourself. And with a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of know-how, anyone can do it. In terms of our remote sensing, we've implemented a LoRaWAN network on our site, which has a gateway. Uh, the LoRa network essentially facilitates connection to hundreds if not thousands of sensors and it has no additional cost beyond the initial physical hardware. You do need to develop dashboards for it and fortunately for us we've had a technology provider in Emerald who has provided us a temporary solution through their dashboard which also um, part of their offering was automation and remote control and monitoring of irrigation infrastructure which we implemented on one of our research pumps and also paired that with remote surveillance so that any of our operators on site can look at that research pump, look at the channel and be able to turn it on remotely and run that to the field without having to drive back and forward. Um, in addition to this, we've implemented uh, some new drones to our fleet. Um, we've got a multi-spec and LiDAR drone now on hand and also spraying and spreading drones that we're looking to see how we can better utilise that around getting some uh, more targeted and efficient application of uh, pesticide and fertilisers. Autonomous machinery is also one of those big areas we've uh, looked at going down the path of. Um, with uh, our location, we have Swarm Farm located out at uh, Jindy, which is about 45 minutes away from site. So through a collaboration agreement, we've uh, implemented two robots on site, one which I've actually been watching on my iPad through these presentations to see how it's been going today, doing some spot spraying on one of our fields. And through this technology, it really does give you the opportunity to engage, do more work in the field without having people in the field, particularly in hot conditions, um, which I think we're going for a bit of a heat wave up north, so very grateful to be down here in the cooler weather. Um, but with these robots, we've got a weed at spot spraying system on our unit Quebec 2, which is on a 
12 metre uh, foldable spray boom, which will only spray the green on brown. We also have Sunny, which is a more configurable platform, which has a three point hitch. This gives us the ability to do some surveying phenology work using the EM38 units, but also we're using it for slashing as well, just to keep the site nice and tidy. Now, the benefit of these robots is they can run 24 seven. You can run multiple robots as a single person and they are incredibly uh, smart in the way they operate and will pull up at any change in layout or detection of obstacles, and they've been great to use so far. In addition to the robots, we've also looked at, well, we're now autonomously spraying. Uh, what are the risks that come with that? And hazardous inversion is one of those big ones. We don't want to be uh, spraying when inversion's occurring, particularly when we've got a cotton farm right next door to us. So we've implemented a Goanarag inversion tower, and one of the cool features of this technology is it's actually available as a network of towers um, across the, um, the uh, eastern states. So with their platform, the Weather and Network Data, which is freely accessible to anyone who signs up for it, you can actually see real-time data from these towers based upon the location, and they'll provide a forecast as to whether or not you're going to expect hazardous inversion conditions throughout the day. So one of the benefits of these is we're looking at how we can integrate this technology stack into the Swarm Farm technology stack, so that when we do have changes in weather conditions, like inversion, we can tell the robot to pull up and not spray when it's not safe to do so. Digital tools are also really important, and smartphones are something that nearly everyone on site's got. So one of the aspects we've looked at as well is what tools can we implement that will improve, I guess, our operation of the facility. And uh, one of them was on-site. It's a digital visitor check-in, and also has the ability to automate people coming and going, internal, external users of a site, contractors, and also provides some risk reporting, hazard identification, job and task management. And another really cool feature of it is the lone worker management. So if you do have people out there working on their own, uh, no one really monitoring what they're up to, they can set up check-in time so that if they don't report in or they don't check out on the time expected, somebody will be alerted. And this is a really useful thing, particularly out in the regional areas where we do have staff going out to external sites as well on their own most of the time. So what are the challenges? The biggest one we've found, I think, is around the workforce. Um, getting the skills and people required to do this kind of work, support this kind of work is really challenging, particularly in the uh, central Queensland area where we're competing heavily with the resource industry. Um, housing availability is also a big issue up there, and I'm sure it's the same down here, but it's something you just need to consider going forwards when you are trying to attract the skills you need. Technology, there are multiple solutions out there. Sometimes it's really difficult to choose the right choices and the snake oil lines get blurred really, really easily. So there's a lot of uh, requirement for people who do understand what they're looking at rather than going and buying the newest, shiniest widgets and thinking it'll solve their problems. And also the ability for that technology to talk to other technologies. We don't want to just have a little, another little silo on the site where everything's confined to that. We want to be able to share that data across different systems to help with that uh, decision making. And also resources are a big thing as well. So like electronic shortages are one of the big issues that we're still feeling a roll on, on after COVID. Uh, getting some of the gear that we want to use on site is particularly difficult because with most procurement processes, they can be quite lengthy. When stuff comes back in stock, by the time you get the procurement done, it's out of stock. So you, you, we're still facing these issues. And also the increase of cost because of that. Like when stuff is available, you might be paying for more for it than what you would in the past. And this is all impacted by the climate variability as well. So as, uh, as things heat up, um, we're gonna have a lot more issues around identifying uh, where the best supply chains come from. And uh, on to learnings with Justine. 
Thanks. One of the, the bits that's been really exciting about this project is obviously there's been um, a huge amount of uptake and development of the, the facility in Emerald, but it's also built capacity more broadly in the industry. So it's allowed us to take the learnings that, that have come from this project and apply it to other projects. And, and in particular, I'll, I'll, I'll name check um, a current project. We've got a GRDC and Future Drought Fund funded project to again establish a smart farm facility out at the Sari Cropping Research Centre um, locally here on the Downs. And what we found is there's some really common parallels in terms of what's, what's involved in doing this. Um, getting those foundational technologies is, is absolutely essential. So, so just like we've been talking about, you know, ma making sure that, that you have the, those layers there, um, you know, you've got, got your connectivity in place and you're solving those challenges that you're able to have that base farm data to describe your environment. You need to have that platform in place before you can do anything else on, on that particular facility. Getting your data management right and the, the data management challenges we've been discussing, you know, do differ depending on the organisational structures that you're operating within. So government agencies, universities um, can be different from, from other private organisations, but you've still got to have that those strong protocols in place and resolve what those issues are for the data management for your particular site. And prioritisation. Prioritisation takes lots of forms. Um, there's lots of scope for how you use a smart farm. Is it, is it about um, research and development of emerging technologies? Is it about creating an ecosystem um, for that development? Is it about extension of existing technologies and, and get greater uptake by the industry? Is it all of those? And then within the cropping system, you know, there's so many different practices that you can apply technologies to that can augment your practices. What are you going to focus on? So there's, there's a really big process in terms of prioritising what your use cases are going to be at that particular facility. And then go for the easy wins. This, this stuff um, takes a lot of change. It's, it's a change of practice for your farm managers. It's a change of practice for your researchers. It's a change of practice in industry in terms of the adoption. Um, so you want to really look at those easy wins to build some confidence. Use those easy wins too to test your systems. You don't have to test your connectivity on a really complex system. You can test it on a simple system. So go for those easy wins first and use that low hanging fruit as, as an adoption ramp, um, both for your stakeholders internally as well as your stakeholders externally. That builds your confidence and builds your capacity to then take on the, the bigger challenges. So I think they're probably the, the key things maybe to take away. Thanks. Thanks, Quentin. Thanks, Justine. Do we have any questions? I've got a question about your inversion networks. Yep. How dense do they have to be? How, yeah, how localised has the information got to be for an inversion network? I, I think that's something we're uh, still looking at. So these towers were initially heavily invested in by GRDC and uh, CRDC. And part of Sorry, thank you. Um, <laughs> these inversion networks were initially uh, invested in by the GRDC and CRDC through GoAnarag. Um, so in Emerald, we initially had three towers, and one of the things we wanted to test out as well, if we have another tower on site, how's that information going to differ to the one that's about 10 kilometres north of our site? So part of uh, adopting this is also for our local benefit, but also to test and validate, well, you know, we've already got one nearby, uh, is there going to be additional benefit of having another one? And if you actually sign up to WANDAP and have a look at their distribution of towers, it's really interesting because we have a lot of stuff coming down that southeast, and then you've got this little cluster up around Emerald. So there's already a lot of adoption of this uh, in the industry, and I think as we go on, the benefit of these technologies is going to become more and more clear as more and more adopters come forward. And I think the ability to be able to open up the application, and anyone can use this, it's not just limited to people who purchase the towers, the towers are available as a network to anyone who signs up to that app. No costs involved, gives you the ability to look at the weather data historically and the forecast, and also record spray records as well. So I think the density is something that we'll see more and more benefit to and get more clarity around it. Goanarag couldn't really tell us what the ideal density is, but I'm sure 
you know, the more of these you have, the more accurate your data is going to be because we all know how easily microclimates can form in different areas. Thanks very much, Quinn. Uh, we got one question right up the back. Thank you. I just uh, wonder in any uh, particular database management systems like Kafka or something like that, are you going to use uh, regarding stream processing and integration? And you have got different smart farms. So I mean, multiple smart farms so that you are, are you going to collect those information together so that data will be in real time? Uh, that means you know you'll have to do um, time series data like uh, using like uh, Apache Kafka or something like that. Are you going to have it in mind or something? Yep. Thank um, you. Yes, very much so. Like uh, so, as Justine mentioned, uh, depending on your organisation you work for, you're going to have different IT requirements. Uh, being government, some of our challenges have been around integrating you know, some of these new solutions, these data pathways with remote sensing technologies to a more secure database system. We have impl implemented some local storage through a local NAS, and we are looking at future opportunities to integrate that with some of DAF's work they're doing around uh, the data lakes uh, that will sit in Brisbane, but also will leverage them to, I guess, make that data more widely available and you know, put onto whatever databases uh, you see it. And that is also one of those things where um, connectivity is important, but you've got to have somewhere for that data to go, and that data's got to be managed, it's got to be secure, and it's got to be easily accessible. And working with our current system, there's a bit of change that's required to enable that better. Uh, but yeah, we are working, uh, working on that, and hopefully in the future we'll have um, some pathways established which the learnings from we'll be happy to share. All right, thank you very much. So join with me in thanking our last speaker for this morning. <laughs> so that wraps up the morning session, but before you go... <laughs> um, we have the poster session, which will be uh, in the foyer. You've got a few moments. You've got 20 minutes from now uh, to grab some lunch. There will be an opportunity to grab a little bit, uh, a second lunch after that, if you like. Um, but in about uh, 20 minutes from now, we'll be having uh, some of the presentations from our posters. So can I get you all to grab your smartphones out now? Take a shot of the QR code. That will enable you to now um, judge the posters. And if you can do that judging of the posters before 3 o'clock, um, we can then decide on who's going to win our fantastic prize for our poster presentation. I don't know what it is yet. But anyway, it sounds like it could be really exciting. So. Can you all join with me in thanking all of our presenters um, this morning? We've had a far-ranging discussion and I think some very interesting stuff. Remember, this is a snapshot. This is only a little bit of what's going on, but it does give you a taste and there's an opportunity there to corner some of our speakers at lunchtime and to corner some of our poster presenters at lunchtime and have a deeper chat with them then. But if you could join with me in thanking everybody for their presentations. And I've just been told we'll be back in here at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Thank you.